um, good morning for, for some of you in some other part of the world. Um, just, we just want to welcome every one of you to our global dialogue with Africa today. And today we've got two guests. Um, last week we featured two of our Malamais and today we are featuring another two. Um, today we want to feature uh, Felicia, Stanley and Amen Puta. Uh, these are going to be our guests, uh, Malamais, today. Felicia Stanley is a licensed mental health counselor in New York State. Uh, she specializes in trauma work and holistic healing methods. Her passion is doing the work to help her community heal and thrive. Felicia is a Malama at Osiri University. And the second guest is Amen. He is a co-founder of Afri, say Afri, Afri Asylum Poism. I'm sure he's going to pronounce that. Oh yes, it is. Yeah, which is aiding with re-Africanization and nation building. He co-hosts a podcast titled "The Morning of Fruit," and is a recipient of the Sunny College Brookport prestigious diversity engagement award. So I'm actually looking forward to this session today. Um, and in order to kickstart the session, Amen has kindly requested that he's got a poem just to set the scene and everything going before we then dive into Q and A's. So Amen, over to you, please. Yes, thank you for that introduction. And um, thank you to everyone that's tuning in and listening to this um, or watching us um, globally. Um, before I actually get into the poem, I want to say rest in peace to Daniel Prude, rest in peace to George Floyd, um, justice for Deon, um, Beyond the Terror, um, Rihanna, Beyond the Teller, and those in, um, who have not received in, any justice for the wrongdoings and the families, um, we are crying for justice for everyone. So this piece is called Re-Africanization, and is pretty much to... Um, Get this conversation started to orient us to what we we're going to talk about. I was taught that my saku was taboo, that my relatives were primates and baboons. Oreo cookies and raccoons guided me to devalue black art and worship wicked white statues of Washington and Jefferson, Roosevelt and Lincoln, Mount Rushmore, expression of oppression carved in my thinking. Yorugu artists desecrating African psyche. The Ma'af was widespread, but so was my Sealy. Heirloom seeds of mitochondria culture planted globally were African fertility inside my mother, giving birth to a liberating force. Spirit rise out the mental corpse. Hair is no longer coarse. Of course, we shall stay the course of making the course or core curriculum that counters European individualism. African psychology resides in the axiology where relationships connect the cosmology. Culture is time dimensional. And history is a system of mathematical coordinates that's geometrical. That's geometric, geometric, geometric. It's not a linear not system not. of time, dates, and death. History is alive. It lives in your breath. When the past is forgotten, it is ruled and challenged and rewritten by the stroke of a colonizer silent violence, generating social amnesia, a form of pathology that disconnects you from your culture features. And what I mean by features, it's not just the way we dress, dance, eat, or behave, it's what we manifest out of this intellectual tool and structure and frame of reference. Because what I'm referring to is culture, the survival thrust, of all black sisters and brothers. Under a colorblind system, making laws out of colors. A superficial paradigm we subconsciously co-sign when we are naturally governed by the universe design. In Africa, we are taught that the feminine's divine, that she's the portal, spirit travels through to enter in the space and time. The matriarch brings balance when she's in the right state of mind but white patriarchy seems to always keep us years behind. Egun shrines keep us aligned with Sankofa. Papa Legba provides the pathway to our ancestors. Ogun builds the highways and weaponry for battle 
and Ochosi, he shows the fastest route that we can travel. Osun, he watches from the highest peak. Oshun produced the love, then the honeybee, sweet. Oya, let us brainstorm, transition as we go through change. And Yemoja grants us permission to go fishing. Wisdom of Obatala, diplomacy of Shango. Self-check my ego, cause supremacy is evil. And the Pantheon keeps me protected from the themes and the schemes of the European and Western psychology, cold sweats and loud screams. Or the quiet warfare that once infiltrated my dreams and left me with vacant esteem, latent possession by a demonic being, alien self disorders, theological misoriented fiends, or addiction where gods comes in forms of pills and lean. Somnambulistic black teens sleepwalking in the frenzy, sedated off of loud packs and henny. The wealth of a man resides in his mind, not in his pockets, which makes heaven pretty hard to find. As I navigate this marketplace, the evidence suggests that it is time to exorcise, because as a people we're possessed, yes. We're hosts for spirits not of our own. Ever since we were kidnapped out of our homes and brought to a former land once deemed unknown, now it's time to reclaim our natural rights to the throne. Re-Africanization. Wow, that's astonishing. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Ahmed, for actually starting off today with such an inspirational poem. And I think that this sets the scene um, for what we're about to discuss today. And I'm sure that you're going to shed a lot of light. Now, this actually brings me to the first question, because I know that part of what you've actually put out there um, ties to this particular question. So what is the nature of the world today as it has to do with racial unrest? Um, and, and I know you, you can share your views as well. So have you been here before or is this time different? Um, you want to answer Felicia first? You want me to answer? You can go first. Okay. Well, so there's nothing new under the sun. It just energy just changes form, and this unrest it's always it always been here, um, especially when you're talking about white malignancy. I don't like using the term white supremacy because it gives power to the to the oppressor. Um, I like to use white savagery, white malignancy. Um, when you think about since they put their show since they threw their show on the road and actually started colonizing and traveling the world the whole orientation was to create chaos and confusion and, and things of that nature. So um, they traumatized themselves before they traumatized others. You look at the medieval times, you look at the, the, the torture methods that was occurring during that time frame. Um, what we call lynching today, um, that was a European import in America because they were hanging themselves before they started hanging in black, black bodies from trees. So this stuff been around for a very, very long time. Um, you look at the motivation of them developing these, these missiles and weaponry, bombs and all kinds of stuff you could think of. Um, the, the greed that they have to just um, put more value inside a piece of metal like gold than a human body shows you what what we're dealing with that's not something that occurred in 2020 that's happened long ago and that same behavior is manifesting in today's time um just to piggyback off of that like i meant said there is nothing new under the sun um this trauma is 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 ongoing the pain is ongoing the only difference is the narratives um, the narratives change, the trauma is the same, the pain is the same, the distress is the, is the same, um, the energy is the same, this, this, this horrific, savage energy is the same. The only thing that's changing is the narratives and the particular names and families that are impacted. However, we know we are a collective people, so we are all impacted when one is impacted. So um, I think that this is nothing new. It's something that we've been battling for quite a long time. So, it, the way I see it, it's, it's basically terrorism, right? We're living at a time of racial terrorism. And not to say that we haven't in the past, it just it seems a bit more 
intensified, especially with uh, the current president. So um, how has this terrorism affected uh, African people uh, collectively and, and individ individually as well, but as a collective people, how has this terrorism affected us in your view? So in my view is, so you, you had this thing called frustration tolerance, right? And we are, we are, we develop frustration tolerance at a very young age. However, when you're constantly under the same pressure, under the same terrorism and tyranny over and over again, it creates psychic stress and toxic stress. And when you develop psychic and toxic stress, it in turns have um, psychosomatic um, symptoms that you develop as a result of that. It could come as ulcers, it could come as diabetes, it could come as hypertension, um, but ultimately it's, it comes as depression. So when you look at depression, depression is an um, internal expression of powerlessness. And anger is an externalized expression of powerlessness. And this is essentially what you see what's happening in our communities um, where depression, it, it, um, it manifests itself as alcoholism, drug abuse, prostitution, um, abuse on each other, proximity conflict versus the term black on black crime. Um, and also you have, uh, 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 which is the anger, which the anger aspect of it, because anger is the aggression aspect of it when you're acting out externally, which a lot of times results in homicide. So we look at homicide on a surface level, like, okay, that's black and black crime, but what's the antecedent? What's occurring in people's lives at a very young age with the microaggressions and the micro invalidations, micro assaults, and all the stuff that's building up on yeah, people yeah. just blow up. You know what yeah. I mean? So, yeah, that's my my take on it. Well, I feel that we are um, many, many of us are experiencing um, I think something called racial battle fatigue, and mm. it definitely manifests physically, mentally, emotionally. Um, hypervigilance, anxiety, depression, like Amen said, um, headaches, elevated blood pressure, elevated, um, elevated vitals, things like that. And we, we are living in a time where it's very difficult to feel safe and our mental health um, pays the price. So perception of control or lack of control plays a huge role on our mental health. Your perception of safety and of well-being plays a, a huge a role in your mental health. So if you are just going about your day-to-day -day life and we have very little, um, very little control over having a racist experience. And so just to know that you can be out minding your business on your day, you or your children or your family members that are not with you and that they can encounter a racial experience that we know can end up in the loss of their life. That type of lack of control and lack of safety and lack of mental and physical well-being weighs very heavily mentally and emotionally and it's definitely impacting us from our smallest children you'd be surprised at how aware our younger children are uh, of their lack of safety and it affects us on up as we get into age and it affects us and our um, inability to protect each other as well yeah. i do want to i do want to um veggie back on something this so we have to talk about when i said the antecedent um a lot of times in this conversation we don't bring in the epigenetic aspect of this is which is the things that occurred to us long before um i'm talking about ancestry you know what happened to our folks at a long time ago and how that impacts our behaviors today you know, so this is this is a reoccurring thing that's been happening for, for generations um and we don't clinically look at the historical aspect that occurred to us right there's no real diagnosis on the books especially in the dsm that that talks about or address the historical traumas yeah. you know so, so that's that's another thing that we have to talk about we do we're literally born into trauma and it's yeah. not addressed and we are just expected to navigate it um with no navigator we're just expected to overcome and succeed in spite of with no help with that 
so pushing this conversation uh, forward because you touched on a lot of things you touched on trauma you touched on uh, you know mental health and things like that so how then can we maintain and protect our mental health you know given the whole situation what is happening right now and the fact that you've just said that we've been born into into trauma and without anybody necessarily teaching us how to navigate these things so how then can we protect how can we be sane in spite of the fact that mm. we are <laughs> there is no one answer to that mm. right we have so many different things that we have to do um collectively uh isolation is hey, healing and us trying to do things as individuals is going to continue to perpetuate the issues that we're dealing with to begin with. Um, so we have to rely on each other to be able to pull out our, pull ourselves out of this situation. We actually have the tools. Um, if you look at our, our ancestors and what they were able to do in the past, and um, I'm talking what I'm talking about is like um, music, using music as a, as, a, as a way of being able to pull ourselves out of these ruts um relationships you know us seeing healthy relationship as a way of of moving and navigating these these difficult times um recognizing that this person have an issue i have an issue we don't have to do it we don't have to address these issues alone we can be collective as as, as going forward and, and making this occur we also need to develop the modalities you know this um we have some things that occurred to us but haven't had the opportunity to address them because we don't have the resources or have not looked at us, each other as resources to develop them, to develop them. Because every single day we are constantly in a battle. So we need the opportunity to actually come together collectively and start sitting down and, and putting pen to paper and just Sankofa, looked at what worked before, contemporize, contemporarize them, you know, and, 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 and modify them so they can, be able to fit in today's time and move move ahead. So I like to kind of look at, um, cause like I mentioned, there is no one answer to that question. Um, but I do like to try to look at things that we can do practically because this is difficult and it's difficult every day. And some days you wake up and you're just exhausted with all of it. Um, I know going to work sometimes, it's just like, <laughs> we feel like we have the weight of the world on our shoulders, but we still have to maintain and smile and be present and be available for our families, for our jobs. Um, but as far as coping, some, some very practical things that I think we can do is control our intake of information. I said a long time ago, never again, never again, will I on purpose watch the blood spill of another black or brown body. I do not oh, watch oh. the videos. I cannot... They are not good for my soul, my spirit. I can't take it. It ruins my whole everything. I can't do it. So I've made a commitment to, when people know, don't inbox me a video, don't message me a video. Mm -hmm. I can't see it. I, I'm unable to, to view that. My soul cannot take it. So um, we don't, that's not how we honor that person. We don't honor that person by watching their murder. It's not how we honor them. And, and most of our souls really can't take it. And it also acts to desensitize us to what's happening. So that's one thing we can do, control your intake, whether it be the news, um, whether it be social media, whether it be your conversations about things that are going on. Sometimes it's too much. Sometimes you can say, I had to step back from it. I can't today. I can't right now. Um, that's not the same as sticking our heads in the sand, but it's recognizing and creating boundaries around what is our, our window and levels of tolerance. Um, being as social as safely possible. I men alluded to it. We are not a people who do well in isolation. We are collective people. We thrive in community and family and nation building. That's how we thrive. So in this um, pandemic, we have to figure out how to be as socially <laughs> safe as possible and still socialize, still connect however we can while of course maintaining um, our health, protect your energy, whatever that looks like to you. If you just need a day where it's just like, listen, I don't need to be around anybody. I just need to play my music, do whatever feeds your soul, whatever feels good and is healthy. And then like, like I said, just be mindful of who you engage with and what kind of conversations you're having, what you're watching. Um, I talk about a lot um, as a trauma therapist, I can't work and play in trauma. So I can't come home and watch, you know, all these trauma filled things. And that's what I do at work all day. There's no time for me to breathe outside of that. Um, 
I think uh, something called valued living is important because I think when we're experienced, like experiencing racial distress, we kind of forget in that moment that we still have a choice of how we react. I feel like a lot of times we're kind of told to just stuff things away, um, not honor them, not honor what happened to us. And we still have a choice that we need to make a decision and um, have behaviors that are in line with our values. So if you experience something, you can still, if it doesn't serve you to just stuff that away and act like you didn't have that experience, address it properly, whether it's at work, in your educational setting, however and wherever you experience it, remember that we still have a choice to behave and act in alignment um, with our values. And attending to our emotions is my last comment on that. Um, everything you feel is valid. We get angry, we get frustrated, we get tired. Sometimes it just feels like too much. You, don't, you feel numb. You don't have anything to contribute. You're just exhausted. You poured everything you have out of your cup. And sometimes your cup feels like it's just overflowing. So just really attending to and acknowledging every single one of those emotions as okay in yours and okay to own. Absolutely. Fantastic. I just, I just want to kind of touch on some of the things that you mentioned. So you touched on, I, I think, I meant touch on music and, you know, kind of fostering relationship, having to having a collective outlook to combat this. Now, um, and you also, uh, Felicia, you touched on protecting your energy, you know, focus on the things. So like more like self-care, yes. control your, the, your intake of information, which is all fantastic. But one of the things I think would be beneficial for a, a lot of our, our listeners is, and, and even for me, I would want to hear from you both is, uh, Ame touched on something very interesting. He says, having a collective outlook to combat this, pulling resources together. Now, how can we do this realistically? I mean, are there tips, are there examples, you know, w in ways that we can actually do this and build that sort of community, nation building, as you called it. How can we do this in realistic terms? Uh, you want me to answer that, Felicia? Yeah, I think she was addressing you. Okay. All right, so... We have, again, we have the tools, right? And we've done this before. We have these systems, we have these spiritual systems like um, Ifa, Akan, Vodun, um, Palo. We have these different systems that develops these collective movements. Within these systems has a mental health component without even saying explicitly mental health, right? Um, and we have to look at what's, what occurred in the past that pulled us away from these systems. I'm going to be honest. Culture is the, is, the, is the thing that binds us. We have a lack of culture right now, a common culture that we're not bonding under. And if we don't have that culture in place, then we're going to have this fragmentation that we're talking about now, right? We're not going to be able to come together without a common culture. So we need to identify what that culture is. Africa is not a monolith. However, we, are, we, are, we recognize that there are so many different things within Africa that are similar threads that binds us together, right? We don't even see these things in our collective, especially here in, in the United States of America, because we've, we've been pulled away from our cultural um, backdrop. We don't know who we are. Just an example of what I'm talking about I had to take a DNA test. I had to go to AfricanAncestry.com and pay, pay $300 to find out who my ancestors are, what, what blood is actually pumping in my veins. You know what I mean? Another example of what I'm talking about is, is looking at Africa within itself. Um, the Berlin Conference split us in these different regions. Although you have West Africa, Central Africa, and South Africa, which is originally Bantu Congo. All those people are Bantu people. However, you got Nigeria, um, Ghana, um, Cameroon, Congo, South Africa, Sudan, all these different places that, that in those regions that exemplify who we are. But when you split people apart like that, you create tribalism, you create all these separations and things like that. We have a common culture. Mm -hmm. We're just not adopting it in our, and, and pushing it for us to, to bond and connect under that culture. So we need to really push, push that back. I mean, push that, bring that forward 
take it from say, like Sankofa, bring it forward and actually adopt those practices so we can actually do the work that we need to do to heal. And also that's part of the decolonization of the mind. That's pushing that cracker out of your head. <laughs> wow. Yeah, um, I had a question for uh, Felicia. Um, you said something earlier about uh, uh, validity. Um, and, you know, for black people, we, we see ourselves as strong people. And, um, sometimes we don't want to um, show our emotions and, and allow ourselves to feel in the moment. So how important is it for us to validate our own emotions, to be honest with our emotions, um, and, and allow our family members to also have their emotional space and, and, uh, and you know, for them to, you know, have a safe space to, to cry if they have to, you know. How important is that? It's, it's absolutely important. It's one of the most important things. We have to think back. Who told you you didn't have a right to your emotions? Who told you the only thing you were allowed to be is strong and carry the weight of the world and labor <laughs> and till you die? Who told you that it's just teamwork and no sleep? Who told you that? Who fed you these lies? Where do we get these things right. from? And, I, and I, we got to be honest, some <laughs> things are come from our family, well-intended, well-meaning, boys don't cry. Right. Big boys especially don't cry. You a big boy? Okay, stop crying. Get up. You all right? <laughs> no, I'm not okay. I'm bleeding. Let's acknowledge <laughs> that. I'm not all right. And so, like I said, sometimes it's well-meaning and it, it just has like these unintended consequences that we don't necessarily mean to put into our, in our, to our babies and we grow up with it and we carry right. it and we feel like I don't, I got to keep pushing. If I cry, that means I'm not being strong. If I'm not being strong, I'm not being what I need to be for my people. We have to unlearn all of that. Emotions are healthy, all of them. It's healthy. Where it's not healthy is when you stifle them, when you don't acknowledge them, when you don't feel. That's what's not healthy. So it's very important to start with our little babies, start with your little babies, teaching them to identify and express and understand emotion, and then start teaching yourself. Because a lot of us are so disconnected with emotion. We might know anger, fear, happy, sad. We forget about joy. We forget about content. We forget about all the emotions and the gamut in between because we are not in connection with them. And we've been told that we're not allowed to be in connection with them. Wow, very interesting. Uh, I mean, but then how can we, how can we pre prevent future racial unrest? Considering the fact that... Um, both of you rightly mentioned that there's a historical trail of events, so it's not new. Right. But going forward, do we still want to relieve all of this experience again and again and again every single time? How do you think we can prevent future racial unrest? That's very difficult to really um, accomplish. Um, I think that what we need, I mentioned decolonizing the mind, right? And um, we have to first identify, we have to first recognize that we are ill. We are mentally ill, right? And we have to come to grips with that. And what I mean by mentally ill, we are operating in opposition of who we are genetically, who we are spiritually, who we are as a people in totality. Once we come to grips with that, then we can recognize, um, okay, what's next, right? Um, just recently, I have really been pushing the effort, and I'm glad that we had this conversation on this panel a few weeks ago regarding um, African versus Black, using the term African versus Black, and the, the historical ramifications behind the label Black, and how we have people has adopted this term Black to identify with when in actuality black is a color it is not a life and it's not a culture and when we look at even in the, the continent of africa you have people that are born in villages you have people that are born in certain domains in africa but they first identify as black when they're told like what are, who are you they say i'm black versus their 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 village name or whatever you know and when we have this racial unrest, it's racial unrest because 
first of all, we're living in poverty. We don't really have, uh, 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 I said again, a common culture. We don't have the, the opportunity in the economic advancement that's going to actually unite us as a whole. You go in other communities, especially here in Rochester. Um, I live in Rochester, New York, for those that don't know. Um, we have suburbs here. And you don't see as much crime in the suburbs as you see in the inner city because of the resources that exist in those suburbs. They don't have the toxic stress or the everyday stressors that people that live in certain communities have. So they take their frustrations out on each other mm -hmm. due to the fact that they lack thereof. So if we have um, opportunities for people to really thrive, be able to grow and, and successfully become who they wanna be. If we have educational systems in place, that's going to teach them their racial identity, who they truly are culturally versus what white people want them to be or told them to be. If we have um, powerful people that are considered, uh, I don't like using the word mentor, but someone, a uh, Jedna, someone that's, that's like a um, Mwalimu, a teacher that they can look up to and be like, okay, this, and they're teaching them who they are. That is all part of the process. And by the way, I wanna, I, wanna, um, I wanna say this too. It can take a fraction of a second to break a bone, but it's gonna take a long time to heal from that wound. When you look at the historical trauma that occurred to people here in the United States of America, KKKA, it took us 400 years to be where we are now. And it's gonna take us a lot longer to get up out of it because of the the psychic wounds, the, the soul wounds, and so on and so forth that's been accumulated for years and years. So it's gonna take a time for us to pull ourselves out of that. And the racial unrest is not gonna just go away and overnight. It's gonna be here for a while. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ahmed, for your point raised. Uh, Madam Felicia, would you wanna, you know, what are your um, thoughts? Well, honestly, just in summation, when we have racial justice, we will not have racial unrest. And until we get there, this is where we are. I just wanted to ask, um, we talked about ancestry and um, the trauma that's passed down, you know, from lifetime to lifetime. So is there a way for us to start digging out of that past trauma? Is there a way for us to, to, to dig ourselves out of this hole? And uh, how would you suggest that we start moving out of uh, our trauma? Because we're carrying trauma of centuries, right? So we have a lot of pressure on our shoulders and we do not want to pass it on to our kids, even though we probably will pass it on some because of how things are going right now. They see what we see, right? And so they're living through the trauma as well. And they're, they're when they see us cry, you know, we have to explain to them, this is why I'm crying and, you know, so that trauma, is is being passed on to them. So how do we how do we start to dig ourselves out of um, this this trauma this trauma that we are are living through? So there are, there are a few ways that we can do this. Um, first and foremost, we have to recognize where the trauma is is stored at in our bodies. A lot of people think that trauma lives in the brain, like it's because of the DSM and how it's how it's translated in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, specifically with post-traumatic stress disorder. We think of it as a brain disease, when in actuality, trauma is passed on through blood, mm -hmm. right? It's passed, it's stored in the body. And when you start looking at um, biological components like your central nervous system, more specifically the vagus nerve, which is also called the soul nerve, this is where your, your, your limbic system is connected to, and it connects from your whole central nervous system, the biggest nerve in your autonomous nervous system. And it connects from your, you know, your, your, your limbic system, your throat, your heart, your, your solar plexus, your stomach, all the way down to your gut. Your gut have 100 million neurons in it. You know what I mean? So when we, when we start looking at all of this stuff scientifically and biologically, we could start addressing the trauma in a, in a systematic way, right? Um, 
Another thing I want to point out too, in the term, when it comes to the science of epigenetics, trauma can stop being passed down within three generations if the behaviors that are occurring to that specific people stop. Right. right? So if we can get past three generations of the systematic torture that's occurring in our bodies, then we can, we can relinquish ourselves from the traumas. We can. So number one is getting with our bodies, settling our bodies, so we can be able to release the traumas. Also, per parental aspect of it, parents, stop traumatizing your children. Absolutely. Stop passing down the things that occurred to you, down to your babies. Recognize that this is a part of you and that you're going to block it right here and you're going to create a reset button in your child to make sure that this don't occur moving forward. If you want to add on, Felicia, you can. Yeah, absolutely. To piggyback off of what you said, especially um, with the parents, it's our responsibility and our job to um, create these little persons that turn into adults who don't have to heal from their past, who don't have to heal from their trauma. That is our responsibility um, as parents. And like I men said, a lot of it, when we, like I see somebody put in the chat, when we heal ourselves, we heal future generations. I absolutely agree with that. You, we have to do the work ourselves the healing work the trauma work the spiritual work um as a mental health therapist there's a specific modality i use um with my clients who've experienced trauma called emdr and as we're processing the memories the painful memories the trauma we one of the questions that always comes up after every set of processing is where do you feel that in your body that's important when i was first learning i was like why you know why are they asking that but it's like i'm mean, we hold and carry trauma in our bodies and as you um go through that process you're asking where do you feel this in your body and then you're assessing now oh, is it still at a seven is it down to a four is it a three or two or one we have to do the healing work however that looks like for you uh, i'm a therapist so i definitely would recommend therapy but i would definitely recommend a therapist who is uh spiritually aware who is um I always say I would recommend an African American therapist if you are African American because, like I meant spoke to earlier, a lot of these modalities were not created by us, so they may not necessarily work for us. So you do need to have somebody who can connect with you and help you, who can understand the spiritual aspect of it, whatever your spirituality piece is. I believe that that is key in healing um, and moving forward. But the key is that we have to do the work to heal our future generations. Otherwise it'll just keep going on, on infinitum, really. Wow, very, very interesting. Whilst I wait for my colleague, Paul, I think he's going to come up with another question. Um, one of the things that you mentioned previously was the fact that in Africa, we've been fragmented um, by some of the, you know, the regions and all of those things have been fragmented. And again, in the United States or, or people even in diaspora have been sort of brainwashed into thinking, you know, about themselves other than the way they should think about themselves. Now, the question I want to ask is, how can we both integrate strategies? So we, that's diaspora and people in Africa, what sort of integrated strategies can be adopted in order for us to um, position ourselves and, and kind of find our identification and, and sort of pass it on, like you were saying, passing it on to, to our children. You know, what ways, what strategies do you think can be adopted? I don't know if the question is clear, but I'm just trying to think about what sort of integrative strategies um, we in diaspora and people in Africa, how can we collaborate and come up with strategies that can advance this? Um, I think it starts with things like this. I think there's such a huge disconnect. And um, I think that Many, many people who are here in the United States, many, many people do not even know personally someone living in Africa. There's such mm. a disconnect. So how can we begin to strategize and we don't even have conversations? We don't even know each other. We don't know anything about each other. We have preconceived ideas and notions about each other that sometimes prohibit us from connecting. Um, you have no idea how many times I grew up hearing people in Africa do not like Black people in America. Right. Like, you know, we have the, so then you meet somebody and you automatically think, oh, they don't like me. Haven't met, haven't exchanged greetings, names, nothing, but we already have these preconceived ideas. So it's important to just even like 
these types of environments to start building the relationships. Once we start building these relationships and breaking down these ridiculous barriers that have us separated, then the work can start. Then the healing can begin. I agree. And I, I, I second that as a matter of fact. I do think that um, we have to get rid of these labels like black mm -hmm. and start yeah. uniting under African because that's our DNA, right? And so I actually started really pushing a social media agenda to counter Black Lives Matter with African Lives Matter. So we can actually start bonding under, under Africa as who we are, mm -hmm. DNA-wise, culturally, so on and so forth. Um, Felicia, you hit a spot on. Um, a lot of folks here in, in, in America were taught to think that people in Africa are living with flies stuck to their face. <laughs> And, and you know starving with rib cages showing and all types of stuff like that propaganda mm -hmm. you know um so we have to recognize that this is the stuff that we've been learning and it's time for us to throw all that away it's time for us to recognize that this is who we are we love each other as a matter of fact um a term zola which is a bantu term means love and appreciation for your sister and your brother we need to really start pushing and manifesting Zola in our lives on a granular scale and creating an African global community. Now, I do want to say this as well, um, as it pertains to a strategy. We're talking about reparations here in, in America and us trying to, you know, us getting our, our, our fair share, our equal share, or what occurred to us was, was owed to us due to the fact of all the... Um, free labor that we gave to this this area right i've been thinking about reparations on a global level when you start thinking about reparations as africans and start itemizing what occurred to us everywhere on the planet then we could come up with strategies okay you know what this is not just a fight here in america this is a fight in africa too because the british and the french they stole a lot of our um, artifacts and you have a museum filled with all kind of african things that that needs to be brought back home you know you have a huge gold reserve in the, in french in, in france that belongs to africans they don't have no gold mines in, in europe but they have a huge gold reserve in in, in europe <laughs> you know what i mean or even with sierra leone they have all these diamonds but there's no diamond there's no diamond mines in in europe Right. You know, we have to recognize, like, listen, we have been pillaged, yeah. we've been raped, we've been tortured collectively, and it's time for us to bond together to get back what's ours. Okay. Uh, Felicia said something earlier about uh, not watching um, Black people be murdered. And um, when she said that, I immediately thought about the George Floyd uh, video, which I watched. Uh, one one good time, and I couldn't watch it anymore. And this question leads to my um, or, or an issue about diet, right? Your diet is not just what you eat, uh, mm -hmm. but what you take in. You know, the music you listen to, the videos you watch, the movies you watch, and the the company you keep. So, how important is diet? And that is including what you eat and drink. How important is diet as we deal with our our trauma? Oh yeah, that's excellent. That that is so important. So, what what's the saying? You are what you eat. Like whatever you consume, mm -hmm. it's, it's what it's like you said. It's not just what you're consuming by mouth. It's whatever you take in. It's the company you keep. There's also the saying that you're the what you're the sum of the five most people that you're around the most often, or something like that. All of those mm -hmm. things are factors. Um, all of those things play a part. All of this about what you're putting in. Are you going to put in poison? Or are you going to feed yourself life? Whether it's through knowledge, what you're learning how you're educating yourself, who you're surrounding yourself. Are you surrounding yourself around negativity, chaos, um, violence? What are you surrounding yourself around? What are you listening to? How do you feel after you listen to your music? Do you feel uplifted? Do you feel better like you're ready to take on the day? Do you feel defeated? Do you feel angry? Do you feel violent? So everything that we consume, everything that we take in, especially things that we choose to take in, some things we end up bearing witness to um, out of circumstance and not by choice. 
But we have so much control over what we put in our mouths, what we listen to, what comes through our eye gates, our ear gates. We have control over all of that. What we lack is discipline. Uh, so <laughs> that's that's the part that's key. Sometimes we know we're not supposed to be eating certain things. We shouldn't be watching certain things. We shouldn't be talking to certain people. We shouldn't be associated with certain people. But so that's what we got to do, like that that root chakra work and and, and that self control and that self discipline. And then we can be more mindful and have make sure that we're consuming more productive things, which absolutely helps and aids in the assistance and the healing of our trauma and our bodies. Now, what's connected to this conversation is addiction. Yes. So when you look at food, food is very addictive. Mm -hmm. And the foods we are eating today is not the foods we were eating 100 years ago. There's a lot of chemicals and, and hormones and things that keeps you um, dependent on that food, right? So let's look at the plantation diet, for instance, right? I, I call it the plantation diet because of the food that our ancestors ate and it became traditionally for us to eat right now. We know that that stuff is no good for us. Right. However, we continue to consume it because we say, oh, well, my... Well, my mom, she she lived to be 100 years old and she ate pork every single day. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and the same thing when it, when it comes to cigarettes. Oh, my, my folk, they, they smoke cigarettes. They, they didn't get cancer. And just create these, these excuses to continue the maladaptive behaviors, you know? And it's the same thing when it comes to the content that, we're, that we are consuming. Over-sexualized content, prostitution, prostituting us through through media and music and so on and so forth, and having all these messages, these memes, um, memes are which are symbols that are passed on from one generation to the next. The only way a meme can survive is if it has a host. A meme is a parasite. And when you allow certain memes that as, as parasites, should I say, like um, symbols, religious symbols that does us no good, but, they're, but we're passing on from one generation to the next, that's going to continue to be to parasitical to our cultural dynamic. So we have to recognize that that's what it is and that we don't have to continue to do that. We can purge that out of us. And by purging, I'm talking about fasting, detoxing, releasing all these chemicals, whether it be something that's um, a, a, a food or a substance that you put in your mouth or something that you're consuming to read. You see me today right now, I'm drinking, this is a, this is a smoothie a detoxing smoothie. Like this is not just no fancy cup, but this is some real powerful, potent stuff in here. This is hemp seed milk with Irish sea moss in it and so much other stuff in it. I'm detoxing. I'm purging out all this nasty stuff that I've been consuming for years and years. And we can also do that on the spiritual level. That's right. Wow. Wow. Great. Very insightful what you both are just talking about today. And I can just imagine what our, the other attendees are also thinking about. We've got a question. Someone is asking, what does a real African community look like globally? And he says this to both of the guests. So any of you can take turns and answer the question. What does a real African community look like globally? That is definitely... Uh... So again, when I first started talking about us as African people, we are not monolithic. Mm -hmm. We are not just a, a, a template. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like when you say Africa, you immediately think that, okay, well, they're going to say, they're going to speak this one language. They're going to say, they, they're going to um, dress this certain way. They're going to um, dance this certain way. And no, this it's not like what I said in my poem. It's not just the way we eat, dance, or behave. It's also what we manifest, right? And so the manifestation of a global African community means that we can travel anywhere on the planet and be welcomed mm -hmm. from other Africans. Mm -hmm. Recognizing that if I wanted to go to Brazil and as soon as I get there, there's a welcome party there. And somebody come here to Rochester, there's a welcome party here. We are welcoming each other everywhere we go. We're going to make sure that we are hospitable mm. everywhere we go. We're going to attend to each other's needs everywhere we go. 
We're going to feed each other. We're going to clothe each other. We're going to make sure that all of our necessities are met. And then once we're able to point um, to, to create that type of, you, it's, um, I don't want to say utopia, but um, a system. Mm. It's African system, global network of, of, of connections. Then that's how we can be able to, you know, just pour our love into each other, create this Zola, this Zola um, spirit everywhere we go. We don't have to, um, look, I don't, I, I, I have to look at everyone as brother and sister everywhere I go that are considered African. So it's just funny. I think the sad thing is that when I heard that question, the first thing that came to my mind is we don't even speak to each other in the street. <laughs> like, so I, it just made me, it, it gave me pause because it really made me think of how much work we have to do. We In my own neighborhood, we pass each other eyes straight ahead no eye contact i know like in different parts of the united states like down south it's a lot more friendly everybody's hey and all that kind of stuff but i just it made me a little sad when i heard the question because it just made me think like we don't even greet each other when we see each other we we have a lot of work to do um but what i men mentioned like in visualizing that type of system is, is a beautiful thought i have um one friend that lives in Ghana. She was born in Jamaica, I believe, but she lives in Ghana. And even that little connection feels so big to me. Um, and it, it makes me feel connected in ways that I didn't have before. So I just, I really think that it's important to figure out ways to start fostering these connections back and forth, these positive relationships back and forth, because that's what I'm in is talking about. The fact that when um, I come to where we, we, we're already welcoming each other. We're creating an instant relationship, an instant bond, um, mm -hmm. just by who, by right of who we are. So the idea of it is beautiful, but we definitely have to dig our heels in and begin the work. Wow, wow, wow. Fantastic. I mean, what you've said is a valid point. Now, uh, someone else has just asked another question, just keeping an eye on the clock. Uh, we have just a couple of minutes to go. Uh, what do you think about the purchase of property by Black community members to create a safe living environment in the U.S.? Could that, part of the, could that be the part of a solution for safety of our community members? So what, what's your thought? And it's, it's to either of you or both of you can even, you know, feed your thoughts through, please. I think that that collective uh, group economics is extremely important. I think it's lost in um, our, um, amongst us. I do see, I see um, other communities and other cultures come in that have that mind process and they band together and families will live in one house until they all work and give this one person their, pay their paycheck and then they move out and they do the next thing for the next person. We have to, first, we've been taught to not trust each other and that's a, a big part of why we don't see things like that happening. We've been taught that we can't trust our brother, we can't trust our sister, but that would be a beautiful thing. And then when we think about how much money has passed through our hands sometimes in our lifetimes, and if we knew now, you know, then what we know now, what we could have done with it, we could, yes, we could have thriving, safe communities where we're policing our own communities, where we're not worrying about, you know, these things happening because we're taking care of our own. I think that's hugely important. And I definitely think that's something that we should continue to look at. We should continue to build these relationships to break down these um, barriers of mistrust amongst each other, pool our money, pool our resources. We have it. We really do. We have the resources, especially collectively. I may not have it by myself. I may, may not have it by itself, but together we got more than we did individually. So definitely pulling our resources. We can, we can do so much. We, we have the resources available. We have to learn to trust each other and build with each other. I think that's an excellent um, thing that we should be, should be doing here yeah. and in Africa, buying land, um, buying communities, like we can do it. We have to shift that mindset. That's the, that's the key right there. And we also have to look at the communities in the past that did it before. Like we have Tulsa, Oklahoma, Black Wall Street. We mm -hmm. have, you know, um, different spots. We have um, Rosewood. You also have spots in, in South, South America that have done this, the Palenque people. They have created a whole maroon space where they, they were able to, to detach themselves from the, the colonial rule and create a community. They've been thriving for hundreds of years amongst themselves and keeping their African cultural intact within South America. So maroonage is definitely a, 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 an answer to this as well. When you think of in the conceptually thinking about buying land and, and coming together as a, as a people, you know what I'm saying? 
We cannot just think about economics. We have to think about culture with that. We can have economics, but the economic is going to end up, this, this, it's not going to last if we don't have a common culture to bond under. I want to thank uh, Mr. Amin Pata and Ms. Felicia Stanley for their very important words and this very important discussion. Um, for all, all those listening, uh, please keep uh, your mental health and physical health in mind as you go throughout this day in this, in this age of, um, of racial terrorism. That's the best way I can put it. And this is age of racial terrorism. And um, again, uh, thank you to our speakers. A uh, very enlightening and very important conversation. Appreciate you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Thank you for bludging as well. Have a wonderful day. You as well. Take care.